to see Steve Wraith. Uh, uh, boxing promoter, events promoter, actor, film producer. I think he's done a few films. Did he produce the... Is it called Fred? About Freddie Foreman. So on DVD I've got that at home. Or is it called Brown Bread Fred? I think it's called Fred. Cam, I'll have to send you the screenshot of the DVD when I get in. Just stick that in as an insert. Uh, good bloke, Steve. He's what we call proper. Proper. I've watched a few of his films that he's done, uh, the YouTube stuff, uh, interviews and that. I think he's really good. Uh, I think he's a football fan as well. He's got to be Newcastle, hasn't it? I can't go that wrong because if it's Sunderland or something, I think Jaffa's Sunderland, I think Steve Rafe's Newcastle. No, Marlock up in Middlesbrough. But, so he's a good bloke and uh, I'll have a day with him. So, peace out. Nice day, nice crisp day. I notice it's got a bit colder up here as I've come up north, but. Uh, it's a lovely area. And that'll probably end up, probably knowing my luck, end up with a speeding ticket or off a camera on bridge or something. Or I'll probably end up getting the rest of my teeth knocked out if it happened we got up here. <laughs> so, alright, so I hope you enjoy this video. Uh, we'll put a bit of production into this. Right, make it jazz it up a bit. We're having fun, aren't we? So it's all good, isn't it? Peace out. Yep, Steve, how are you doing? I'm good, mate. How are you? I'm all right. Uh, I made it then. <laughs> yeah, good. Good to see you, mate. Finally, we've been nice. talking about it for long enough. So. Yeah. Uh, nice to uh, nice to see you. Uh, we'll jump straight in then, Steve, because you've you've got you've led a very colourful life. You uh, you've got a lot of. Uh, what, what, what were you spinning a lot of plates, aren't you, at the moment? Yeah. You, you obviously you're doing boxing promoting. You've been in, you're doing acting. You write books. You've done seventeen books. Uh, you've got a podcast. You put events on. Uh, looking at some of the people in here, we've got Roy Jones, Tommy Earns, uh, Duran, Mike Tyson, Joe Fraser. Anthony Joshua, Floyd Mayweather, and Nigel Man. Some of these you've had on two and three times, haven't you? So you've been yeah. very busy. Uh, so it's nice for you to give me some of your time today. But you started out in unlicensed, didn't you? Yeah, the unlicensed game. Um, you know, I got approached uh, initially by uh, a good pal of mine, Big Phil Riley. Um, he's, he's obviously one of the relations of the Sears family in Newcastle. Um, and he asked us if I'd be interested in promoting unlicensed boxing. And to be honest, you know, I, I promoted events, you know, maybe doing the small football talk-ins with the likes of Supermac and that, but I'd never even considered boxing at all. Yeah. I'm a boxing fan, yeah. but never even, you know, never even considered it. So I said I would go and have a chat with him. He said, uh, you know, basically we will do everything. He says, you just need to promote it, sell the tickets, get the venue. Maybe he's pulling the DJ, pulling, you know, you know, the fighters is the key. You need, you need to advertise and get fighters. And this was really in the infancy of like social media. So wasn't as easy as it probably is now but I said well I know a few ex-pros you know he said well that's what you need he says get get people who can sell tickets he says and you know we can do the rest so I went away I had a think about it and um, I thought well why not you know it's something a bit different and uh, that's where I got the the real boxing bug I mean I trained as a kid I didn't yeah. never fought but I, I used to go down and do the the training at um, Glenn McCrory's gym uh, he, he had a gym in Felon, Felon where I lived in Gateshead with Dave Gregory so I used to go down, I used to train with Billy Hardy, Glenn McCrory, Terry French, um, the O'Hagan brothers, um, Gary Furby, who was a pro at the time, under Tommy Conroy. So I, I knew I knew what it was all about, uh, but I had these contacts, and there's another big lad, army lad called Paul Fisk. So I had a chat with them and said, look, we might be doing something a bit different here. Gets you a chance to get in, in the ring. It's all... It's all secure. We've got, um, you know, we've got like pu uh, public liability insurance. There'll be a referee. You won't get mismatched. The lads fancied it, um, so I got a venue. I got Felon Social Club, which is no longer there, which was at the bottom of my street at the time. 
and you know it was a 400 capacity venue um, I managed to persuade John Davison Deva, to make his farewell fight so that was an exhibition fight um, he was going to fight a kid called Rob Newbiggin uh, that was going to be top of the bill so I, you know, obviously I knew I needed a ticket seller I've got Gary Furby on I've got a young lad called Tony Quinn on who was like up and coming I've got Paul Fisk on um, and a couple of other like local names just, yeah. just to have a go on this show worked out the finances um, you needed the ring you needed the referee, you needed an ambulance, you needed to be within three mile radius of a hospital. Obviously I needed money for tickets, posters, um, wanted a DJ, I got local footballer Joe Allen to be the MC. Um, and that was it. The rest, the rest, you know, the rest was all about getting the tickets sold. But piece of cake, uh, 400 capacity venue, I had, five, I had 500 people in. Um, <laughs> but, Already you were breaking rules. <laughs> exactly, but, but it, was, it was one of them, you just looked at it and thought, this is fantastic. Yeah. Uh, the, the buzz I got off that, and just, you know, you couldn't bottle Dave I walking into the ring again, yeah. and just hearing his name ring out one more time. Um, it, it obviously did a lot for Rob Newbiggin, um, Dave I won, obviously, you know, it was a, was a win in the exhibition. Um, Rob Newbigan ended up becoming a woman, so uh, I do, uh, not not long after that he had a sex change. So I'm not sure whether <laughs> I'm not sure I'm not sure whether it was the effect of the fight that did that. <laughs> but uh, but uh, but legends were born that night. I had um, Gary Furby and Tony Quinn came on, went on to be big successes. Gary Furby went on to have over a hundred unlicensed fights. Yeah. Uh, he became the he became the governor. Uh, he took the governor belt um, down in London and. Um, but we had a lot of fun, um, and, and I've got to put a lot of that down to Spencer, Spencer Brown from Blackpool, yeah. because it was his idea. He set the English box. He uh, does well with it, doesn't he? Yeah, he, doesn't he? he set the European Boxing Federation up, and through him, um, it grew. But because it had legit uh, legitimacy, it had you had licenses for the fighters, yeah. you had the public liability insurance. Because the matches weren't, there was never mismatches on the shows. Yeah. Um, and, and everybody got paid. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it was done properly, and you know, from my perspective, it was a good way to to learn learn the trade. And we did bigger shows. We went from that uh, gated leisure centre. Within three fights, I was putting on a show at the leisure centre. He has me who didn't even think I could do this. Yeah. Um, and it found it was pretty easy. And we did. Um, we had over twelve hundred at gated leisure centre. We had some great fights on. It was another old pro, Frankie Foster, um, uh, Stuart, fought Stuart Rimmer. And I still say that's one of the best fights I've ever put on, you know, in all time because it was like Rocky. You had mm -hmm. Frankie Foster was knocked out on his feet in the first round, um, and then came back in the second round, had Rimmer in the same situation, and then Frankie Foster again in the third round. It was just, you know, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. And then the big rivalry was born um, between Decker Heggie and Gary Furby. Uh, it's a fight that they both still talk about to this day. Um, Decker seems to think that he was under some kind of drug influence in that fight. I, I assure you that he wasn't. Gary Furby came in and knocked him out in 15 seconds. This is somebody who claims to be the governor. Um, now, um, Gary Furby, you know, by far and above the better the better fighter. Mm -hmm. But he caught him cool that night and knocked him out in 15 seconds. You know, it took uh, it took Decker longer to get in the ring than it you know than he than he actually lasted in the ring. But that's the kind of stuff that was happening. Legends were being born locally. Tony Quinn went on to do quite well. Uh, Gary Gary Furby did really well. Um, as I say, over a hundred fights, and it was just something to be excited about. And then Spencer started really to um, you know to, to bring in legends. So he you know he had contacts with a few American promoters and American fighters. Um, and I think it was like around about the seventh or eighth show, we'd moved on to the Lancastrian Suite in Dunson, which again is a, a huge venue. And uh, Larry Holmes came. Um, we got Larry Holmes to come over. Obviously, we had to pay him to come. We did. Uh, we did it for the NSPCC, uh, so we're raising money for some charity as well. And we had Larry Holmes there to come as guest speaker at half time. Um, it was fantastic. You know, got a lot of publicity, and that again really took it to the next level because with Spencer having those kind of contacts um, it meant that alongside the unlicensed boxing shows I had the opportunity now to try and bring boxing legends to Tyneside. That's brilliant, that's brilliant and uh, uh, let me just forward a little bit, at the moment boxing is it's struggling at the moment isn't it, do you know with small all guys yeah. you do small all shows and there's promoters in South Yorkshire that do it and all around the country, do you think that boxing could end up going back to doing a lot of unlicensed, do you think, Steve? Do you think that might be the way forward? Without all these rules from the board and 
Do you think? Do you see that's where it could end up? I think boxing as a sport at this moment in time is 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 in big trouble. Mm. Um, obviously, I've gone after you know eight years in the unlicensed. I've gone into the pro game. I'm now into my ninth year as a pro promoter and my um, sixth year as a as a pro manager. And I think all the hard work the the likes of Phil Jeffries, mm. um, myself. Have done over the last. You're, you're two only guys up here, aren't you? That do it. Like, there's, there's yeah, one, there's there. been one or two try. Yeah. Um, one or two pretenders to the throne, if you like, who've tried to come up and, you know, um, yeah. rattle our cages, if you like. Yeah. But yeah. I think you know, me and Phil are too, you know, too long in the tooth to, to suck yeah. our fools gladly. Yeah. Um, but we, you know, for a long time we didn't work together. Um, but we're knocking heads. <laughs> We never knocked heads. Yeah. I mean, look, he's a Sutherland fan and I'm a Newcastle fan. <laughs> so we're always going to knock heads on football. Yeah, yeah. But you know what? Um, you know, I've got the utmost respect for Phil Jeffries. He gave me he gave me help to get into the boxing game. Yeah. And all of those people, all of those backstabbers who tried to stir the, the, mm. the dirt between me and him early doors, what they didn't realise was that me and him were pals. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And a lot of people were talking about him were back and trying to say Steve said this and Phil said that. and you know. But we're always in communication. We always spoke to each other. Yeah. We always played to each other. But Phil gave me the opportunity. Phil, like um, this for me, isn't it? Yeah, he gave me. We're always out of our four last night. You're gonna do, aren't you? Because you're passionate, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. But he gave us the opportunity to get in. I'll yeah. always be eternally grateful mm. for that. But yeah. then, a few years ago, when um, you know, when Lewis Ritson was just starting to, to to reach, you know, his his potential. Yeah. Um, I just reached out to Phil and said, look, you know, you're gonna be busy with with Ritson. You know you're gonna have a lot on your, your lot on your hands with 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 that because I think you'll go all the way. Mm. And from my perspective, I said, you know, why don't we just work together? Why, you know, you, he's got he's got so much. Go we both got so much going on because we mm. both got well, yeah. we're fingers in a lot of pies. But I said, why don't we just work together? Yeah. You know, that will shut everybody up, and that's what we've done. And it's a trust game because you've got to trust each other. You no, know, yeah. but but you know, over the last three and a half years, four years, been great. You know, we've, we've worked together, and it's been for the benefit of Northeast boxing because yeah. suddenly. We're not competing against each other because that's what was happening. Phil was putting a show on, and I'd be putting a show on. Sometimes we had the crazy situation where our shows were back to back, one week after the other. Mm. Um, you know, yeah, that's rivalry. But now that we're not doing that, then it hasn't affected it at all. We've worked together and we've worked well, and it has been for the benefit of Northeast Boxing. Have you put anything on it? Uh, it's not Roker Park, is it? Stadium Alive? Yeah, we'll do that every year now. Phil was, on a Sunday, doesn't it? Phil was kind enough to, to, to once we went in, we went in 100%. So mm -hmm. I've, I've, done the, the sta I've done the stadium show three yeah. times. But there was, a, there was an occasion where Phil had withdrawn his promoter's licence mm -hmm. and said he was walking away from boxing, but he still wanted to keep that show on and he allowed me to promote that by myself. So I've done four of them and, and yeah. you know, it's the biggest show. But getting back to your question about yeah. boxing, yeah. It's, it's screwed, mate, at this moment in time. Small hole boxing is screwed. Um, what I'd like to see is I'd like to see maybe Eddie Hearn or Frank Warren, one of these bigger promoters in the UK, maybe repay the faith that we've had in them. Do you know what I mean? By maybe helping us out. Yeah. You get big money coming in with uh, TV, yeah. um, as we know, you know, the, the, the amounts that come in for mm. for every fight that, that Eddie Hearn puts on with Matchroom or Frank puts on with BT. Um, you know, I'm sure that the you know they've got bills to pay like we have, but yeah. there should be a little bit maybe investment thrown at these these poor lads who are sitting at home doing nothing. I mean You've got people like, you know, Lewis Ritson, who obviously Phil manages, Ellis Corey, yeah. um, who I manage, yeah. who's up and coming, who's Northern Area title holder, whose careers have literally been put on hold through no fault of their own. They're not getting an opportunity to box. He'll so if they're not playing that Ellis, I think he's really good. Yeah. If you can't if you can't put these people um, on your televised shows, I understand that. But could you not maybe you know you know, throw us a line? Give yeah. us, give us. A a date. Date. Why don't you finance a show in the northeast for us? It's not mm. going to cost you. It's not going to cost you a fortune. Yeah. Put a small hole show on uh, to show a little bit of gratitude towards yeah. the people who've helped put the shows on up in the northeast. Mm. Joe Laws and, and Lewis Ritson more or less sell the arena out on their own. Yeah. These kids haven't had a fight. Why don't you give them the opportunity? Why don't you say, well, look, we'll hire Gates at Leisure Centre or we'll hire here. We'll come and run the show for you, and we'll get you a little payday just as yeah. a thank you. Do you yeah. know what I mean? And you don't have to do it in Newcastle, Manchester, Sheffield, London. It's not as if you're it's not as if you're doing it around the world. But just show a little bit of faith back to the people in Sheffield as well who've who've come out in their thousands. And you know, it's just 
for me, I just don't think there's been that kind of that kind of foresight. They're looking at the big picture. They're looking at the Joshuas and the Furies, and they're not looking at small box, small boxing. And and for me, there needs to be something put back because if there isn't, what you're going to see is fighters getting fat, fighters walking away because yeah. they need to pay their bills. Fighters in prison for turning to crime. Fighters in prison for turning to crime. You're going to see. A, a massive change and, and mm. there's no light at the end of the tunnel with COVID that's the big problem you know what I mean It's whether you believe it's real or not unfortunately the government believes it's real yeah. and that means that when you know we're going to see further lockdowns If it could be a UK lockdown it could be a regional lockdown but you will see further lockdowns we might get a position where boxing can return back to normal and they allow crowds in but what will happen is we'll go all the way through eight week build up to a show and then Newcastle or Sheffield, wherever, will get locked down. And then suddenly, fight's off. Mm. You haven't got a fight. You know, you show all that preparation you've done is, is gone because you know, there's been a lockdown in your area. So it's doom and gloom um, at the moment. But I would like to see the big promoters and maybe even some of these big fighters who've got a few quid, maybe at least have the, the, you know, the, the common sense to say, well, actually... I might do that. Good little bit of PR for me that if I go and do something and throw something back into local yeah. boxing. Because if we don't, we're going to lose them. Do you know what I mean? It's we haven't even touched on the amateur game, but it's be exactly the same for the kids. Yeah. Um, There's no amateur boxing, is there? More England amateur, England bo amateur boxing sent letters out, and there? There's yeah. no this year now, is there? And, and I mean, you're not going to see any change. I mean, you know, you go, you know, you 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 go to the amateurs as much as I do. Probably yeah. you pop in and you see yeah. them, but. Let's, let's also look at like the committees and stuff. The committees are all of a certain age. You know, the re the referee, you know, the, the people who sit at ringside and they run the amateur box, and yeah. you know, a lot of them are in the you know, 60s and 70s. They're in that age group where they don't want to go out. They can't go out, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and I don't know. I just don't think we're ever going to be the same again. It's, it's, not, it's not a positive sign for me. Like, and I've watched boxing return. I've watched these shows. I've watched Eddie's Back Garden. I've watched BT's studio shows. Um, I've enjoyed it because I enjoy boxing. It's just yeah. good to see the lads back in the ring. Yeah. Um, but you know, when you look at all the rules and regulations, I've had the emails from the Boxing Board of Control putting shows on. It's 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 just unachievable for a yeah. small hall show yeah, to go enough. through all of those rules and regulations and get it done. It's bad enough having to deal with a lot of the rules and regulations we have to face just to put a shoe on. Yeah, with before COVID. <laughs> before COVID, but now it's an absolute bloody, it's no, an absolute no. bloody nightmare, mate. Yeah, and it's, it, I, I just, I fear for small hall shows, I really do. Mm. Do you think that, uh, do you think that boxing is, uh, how can I explain it? Do you think that the greed's ruined it in the last few months, whereas, they're just more interested in the big the big promoters and the that kind of thing, yeah? Greed ruins everything. It's yeah. spoiled football more than it's spoiled boxing, yeah. I feel. Um, yeah. Obviously, I'm a big Newcastle fan. Um, you know, I, I've watched with interest and covered it on the NUFC Matters YouTube podcast um, with regards to the takeover. You know, Newcastle United have got the Saudis willing to come and buy the football They're club. They're not doing it now, are they? And no. suddenly, well, it's, it's still ongoing um, behind yeah. the scenes, but we're in this situation where... You know the, the the top six cartel in the Premier League don't want to see Newcastle, little old Newcastle, become a a, a force. Of course, yeah. And you know, so they dictate what goes on. And at the minute, Richard Masters is the sticking point of the Premier League. You won't allow it to happen. So mm -hmm. you've got it in football um, more, I would say. With boxing, you know, it's it, it's television. It's maybe it's not the greed. It's television that spoils it because they they pull the strings. Do you know what I mean? And and that's. That again could see massive changes coming forward. I mean, we know that Eddie Hearn has to do X amount of shows a year on Sky, and he gets 20. paid. He gets paid for those shows. But if he doesn't hit that remit, then he'd have to refund his money. So you're looking at that and thinking it's TV once again that dictates. You know, um, if that money wasn't there, would would Eddie be involved? You know what I mean? Would Matchroom be a thing if, if there wasn't the money coming in from no, TV? They'd walk away, wouldn't they? And it's the same with BT and, and Frank. You know, I mean, he's landed on his feet with that with that after being on the wilderness for a little while. But um, mm. you know, he's he's again somebody who you know is in it for the money. You know, he's he's in it to make money. But me and the likes of Jaffa and Dennis Hobson and Sheffield etc. Go and ask them. You know, you, well, you have, you've met them, you yeah. know them. You know, we're not in it for the money. It's, hobby, it's hobbies to you, boys, isn't it? It's a hobby. It's a passion. It? Yeah, it's a passion. passion. I think I've, I've said to you before, it's like the line in The Godfather. Every time I try to get out, get out it pulls us back in, yeah. boxing, because it's, it's in my heart. I love the sport. Mm. But 
Um, there's been times where I've just been absolutely sick, um, where I've had a fight, I've had a show or whatever, and a fight has pulled out, or a fighter doesn't make weight. You know, you know, boxers have got one job to do: make weight, keep fit, turn up on, you know, turn up, you know, and get weight on the scales. And there's that many of them who don't take that seriously. That's the easy bit for them. I'm the one who's running around like a blue ass fly for eight weeks, trying to put a show on, trying to get the sponsorship in to cover the show. Um, and I've always said, I've always been honest, it's a misconception that the promoters sit and making a fortune because mm. none of us do. Not in a small hole game anyway. You yeah. know, it costs you to put a six fight card on, you know, on average around about five grand to put that show on, to pay for your ring, to pay for your doctors, to pay for your, um, you know, your ambulance, to pay for your paramedic, to pay for your tickets, your posters. Uh, your security, your ring girls, your venue hire, your food, all of these things add up, do you know what I mean? And that's before a fight has been paid. Um, so that's when people say, and I know you don't agree with ticket sales, yeah, uh, yeah. by fighters, ticket, but, deals, ticket deals, ticket deals for ticket deals for, for fighters, but in the Northeast, it's, you know, it's the way I was brought up to do, yeah. you know, like with, with Phil Jeffries, that's what he was doing, and, and, mm. and I, learned off, I learned off the master, really, but you, you've got to do that, because if yeah. you don't, Unfortunately, people just wouldn't come yeah. to the shows as much. If a fighter's going to knock on the door of one of their mates and go, I'm fighting next week and you're going to come and see us, they're going to say yes. Yeah. But if I'm putting it on Facebook, I've got no connection with their friends. It's very difficult it's very difficult for them to even know that the person's fighting. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's all very well saying the promoter should promote and, you know, small hole boxing wouldn't work if, if you weren't doing ticket deals. Certainly bigger shows, I think, you know, where Sky's involved or BT's involved, then I don't understand ticket deals for those people. Those people should just be paid because they're getting paid. The fighters should get paid. And if you sell tickets, you should be allowed to keep your money. Mm. But it's, um, but yeah, you know, I think just with, with, with the boxing side of things, it's 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 just, it's a depressing time being involved and uh, mm. I just don't see how we're ever going to get back to normal. Do you think that uh, Lewis Richardson and Savannah Marshall fight next month on Sky at Newcastle? The word I had, you know, over the last 48 hours um, from Frank Smith at Matchroom was that it uh, might not go ahead at yeah. all. Um, and that's a big concern if it doesn't, you know, because if it doesn't go ahead, then, you know, where do we stand? When are they going to fight again? I hope it does. I hope I hope that it is going to go ahead. But obviously I've got a vested interest because Ellis Corey's on that show. It's a big step up for him to be fighting on a Matchroom show, you know. He's just, he's just fought, you know, just fought and then defended. Uh, won and then defended the Northern Area title. He's up and coming. He's an up and coming welterweight who could cause a few surprises. He wants to fight in in an ideal world. He wants to fight Joe Laws, um, but Joe Joe's obviously changed weights and you know yeah. he's he's become friends with Ellis. But I'd like to see that fight. I think that's a fight the North East should see. Joe Laws versus Ellis Corey is the fight which would be explosive. Um, you know, winner takes all. And one of them would go to the next level, you know. And I think that would that would be a fight that I would like to personally see. But yeah, you you, you know, if it's not on, that's what I'm saying. Where where do these fighters go? What do they do? Um, you know, it, it it's, it's such a it's such a difficult time. But you know, like Ritson lost on that split decision. That that split decision. Yeah. Um, I felt he was hung out the dry a little bit. We were speaking off camera yeah. before then. Before then. Before and after. Um, but now you know he, he he's come back. He's bounced back, which all all good fighters do. Yeah. And um, you know the, the, the Robbie Davis Junior was wasn't wasn't a fluke. It was a well earned victory. Do you know what I mean? Against, against a good fighter. Against somebody who everybody you know who, who maybe he's everybody's favourite. Exactly. Favorite, wasn't exactly it? Yeah. And um, I get on with Robbie. He's a great lad, by the way. But it was good to see Lewis do that. He bounced back, so he's you know he should be given that opportunity. I, I, if you want my honest opinion, I thought I thought it was a bit quick. He got fast track because of his knocking you know everybody knocking out everybody out. out. But we knew there was always going to come a time when he was going to yeah. reach that thing. But that's where that's the promoter's job to promote and get you to the next level in the right time and fashion. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And you you need to be treated. Maybe we're a year early going for that fight. One of these. Yeah, things. yeah. And then you've got on the flip side of that, you've got somebody who we all know in the northeast. He's not a secret anymore. Is one of the best fighters I've ever seen from this area in my time, Tommy Ward. Yeah. And he seems to be getting bypassed every time. He should he be given. Defeated. He should be given the opportunity to win a world title. That kid yeah. deserves it. He's grafted his you know balls off to get to where he is. But every time you think he's going to get somewhere, it just seems that there's you know somebody pushing against it. But he. He deserves a he deserves a chance, Tommy, to win that world title, and um, and I know for a fact when he does get that chance, he'll he win it. You know, it's a good little. I'd like to see him fight Josh Whale. Yeah, 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 that would be a good fight. That's a good fight, Josh Whale and Tommy. 
But I was lucky enough to put Tommy on on one of his, was it his debut or was it his second fight? I can't remember now, Phil, Phil would probably be able to tell you, but he, he boxed, a, boxed a young lad on my show at the O2 Academy. I think it was only my first, it might have been my first show, my first pro show. And he knocked the kid out from South Shields, um, you know, and that was one of his first knockouts in his career, early knockout. But yeah, he's boxed on a lot of my shows, Tommy, thanks to, you know, Dave Garside and, mm. and Phil Jeffries for allowing him to go on to the shows. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I've, I've watched him grow, you know what I mean? But always been a stylish boxer, a stylish technician, and uh, just a pleasure to watch, you know what I mean? A pleasure to watch. His brother Martin was a warrior, um, but you know, Tommy's, Tommy's just like that. Just different gravy, as you would say. Do you remember Dennis putting that world title fight on it, North East, Martin and uh, Stewie Hall, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was a good fight as well. It just got, draw, it? Yeah, got cut, wasn't it? Got cut, it was a, it was a cut. I mean, that's, look, I, I had my had Dennis. I've got a good relationship with Dennis. Do you know what I mean? Again, somebody who you could always pick the phone up and learn yeah. off. A couple mm. of times I rang him and, uh, again, you know, people did try to stir things between me and Jaffa and then me and him, but... You pick the phone up to people and yeah, people know what you like and me and Dennis have always I can I know I could pick the phone up to him tomorrow if I needed some advice and he'd give us an honest opinion. Mm. And he's you know, I did that very early doors, do you know what I mean? And he's one of you know, he's one of the people you could do that too. My best mates in boxing, I, I would have to say Mal Gates, a trainer from South Shields. Uh, we've put some great nights on together. We did Anthony Nelson's English title fight against Terry Broadbent down in South Shields, which is good. That's that picture there, actually, Roberto Durant's holding the poster up from that uh, from that show. You can see winner takes all. Yeah. That was my very first title fight, English title fight. Um, you know, and I mean that was just a you know new thing to do. But yeah, you know, from my perspective, working with Mal, great, great guy, Spud Bullet, um, who you know whipped a lot of the early shows for us with Andy Wells. Another person who who was always honest, could always pick the phone up and talk to. You. And I've got to say, Mick Marsden. Um, He's a bit of an unsung hero, Mick, because Mick's obviously, as everybody knows, is a trainer, yeah. but he's also a matchmaker. And, he, yeah. and from day one, he's he's been the matchmaker on all of my shows. And uh, there's been a few new new you know pretenders trying to come in and do the job. Mick's never let us down, and he's a kind of I'm not, I'm not a flapper. I was in the early days. He'll tell you that. But if if a fight collapses with three days to go mix your man to get you out of that hole do you know what I mean and like I've worked with a couple of other matchmakers when I've worked with other promoters and I've I've never found them you know never found anybody who can come to mix level so he's uh, you know he's, he's good and you get a good show and that's what it's all about people want to come and see a good show yeah. and of course as you know a lot of us have to rely on foreign fighters uh, but even the people he works with you know the foreign fighters who come in at least they're not you know, it, it, it's not a mismatch, it's not a farce, do you know what I mean? These fighters do tend to come and have a go, which is what you want. But, um, but yeah, yeah, Mick Marsden again, somebody else who I've, you know, who I've got a hell of a lot of time for, you know. Brilliant. Uh, moving on then from boxing, uh, you've put shows on uh, events, so I should say. There's, are they kind of like the evening whiffs? Yeah. Well, the evening whiffs, don't they? Gaza, Shearer, Freddie Foreman, Dave Courtney, Carlton Leach, and all that. What, what's Gaza like? Oh, Gaza, I mean, I've known Gaza since 1988. Um, I was a kid, actually. It's, I'd just left school. Newcastle got um, Wimbledon in the FA Cup, fifth round. We never used to get past the third round. And uh, this was a big deal for us. And um, somebody, I'd, I'd basically queued outside Newcastle to get a ticket one day. And I got pushed out the queue. I got back in the queue. But then when I got to the actual old ticket office, Turned out I was in the queue for Chelsea at home, not Wimbledon at home, oh, yeah. and nobody would let us jump in because there was only a hundred tickets left. I went home. I was in. I was crying. I was gutted. And um, one of my mates says, uh, "Gaz has numbers in the phone book. Give him a ring. He sorts people's tickets out." And I was like, "Nah, it's rubbish." So anyway, I had a look through the phone book and looking down, and he was his dad was John Paul Gascoigne, and he's Paul John Gascoigne. So I'm looking down. Sure enough, there's three three Gascoigne's all in Dun is it all in Dunson, yeah, all in Dunson. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I rang the first one, wrong number, rang the second one, wrong number, rang the third one, and when I rang the third one, I went, hello, is Paul there? And it was his dad who went, and he went, I, two seconds, who is it? I went, uh, Stevie's mate. Um, so anyway, Paul, two minutes later, Paul comes on the phone, hello. I went, hi, my name's Steve Wraith, I have, and, and just rabbited the story about how I hadn't got the ticket, blah, 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 and he goes, um, he says, get yourself to the grounds, be outside the club shop on Saturday before the match, half past 12, I'll see you there, I'll sort your ticket out. And I, was like, and I was like, wow. So I got up the got up the match at half past twelve uh, at St James's Park. At St James's Park. <laughs> and uh, he turned up in his old in his car. What him car and, did him, he and have? Jimmy, him and Jimmy and uh, old escort. 
<laughs> and Jimmy Five Bellies. Jimmy Five Bellies, who was Jimmy Three Bellies then. And uh, pulled up, he goes, uh, there'll be two minutes, lads. And there was me and about four other kids standing there. And he um, got out of his car, parked his car, walked over to her. He says, uh, he had a list of names, bam, bam, bam. And then Steve, give us a ticket. And that was it, that was the first time I met him. But from there on, um, I, I got, I, you know, it was different circumstances. Uh, I did a charity event in 95. I knew a guy, God bless him, who's gone now, Ray Khan, who, who was good friends with the Gascoigne family. And he got he got he got to come to an event that I had Charlie Creat uh, for charity. Uh, but it was it turned out it was the day that Gaza signed for Rangers. Um so Gaza couldn't come, but his mum, his dad, his sisters all came, his brother came and they brought signed shirts and all that. So we still had the Gaza effect, but without Gaza there that day. And then just I always kept in touch with the family from that moment on and you know, he's never let us down. If there's been something for charity or something for this, he's always helped us out. Uh, but then when I went into doing the, the, the spoken word events, the after dinner events, I put them on numerous times. I've had some great nights and I've had some terrible nights. Mm. Um, and it all depends which Paul Gascoigne turns up. Some I've had to cancel, um, which, you know, is, is just because of his battles with his addictions. Mm. And, and that's, it's awful to say, but you just you just never know week to week how Paul's going to be. And, you know... Yeah, we are in 2020. I've seen the good and the bad of Paul this year already. I've had him on the phone at times where he hasn't been well. Um, but then, you know, his house has been burgled, sadly, this well, week. recently. Just, just this week, 140 grand worth of jewellery he's had taken out of his house. Um, but he was on TV and he looked great. Um, he was getting interviewed by Piers Morgan and looked absolutely fantastic. So I hope he stays well, um, you know, and will I work with him again? I know for a fact I will, because he's, you know, he's me, he's me pal at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Shira, yeah, work with Alan. Been very lucky to work with Alan. He's very guarded. Somebody who, um, somebody who doesn't allow many people into his close yeah. circle, but I'm yeah. pleased to say that I've, I've been, you know, in, in that circle for many years. A lot of it comes down to the fact that I was a doorman for 18 years in Newcastle, so I got to network and got to meet a lot of my heroes. Yeah. Um, most doorman aren't football fans, but I was. Mm. So I was head doorman at most places I worked, and you know I was always able to open the door for a lot of these people and you know get them in, jump the queue, yeah. um, if they got any trouble, sort it out. So from my perspective, that's how I networked, but that's how I got to know a lot of these people. And mm. I think the real trust thing came with Alan when um, his daughter started to drink in Newcastle. Um, and I looked after them. Do you know what I mean? I just, you know, I'd make sure they got in the taxi, put them in the car, whatever. And uh, he appreciated that. And I just standing on the door one night, and I just got a a, a phone call um, off a number I didn't recognise, and it was Alan just to say thanks, and that's me number and keep in touch. So it's nice when you get that, um, yeah. and that's and that's how you build it well, up. Well, they're just normal people like us, aren't they? The same sort yeah. of brilliance, aren't they? Working but it's a, class. it's a it's a trust thing. But that but yeah, the other events I've done over the years, mainly football, because I'm a Newcastle fan, as I say, mm. that's me bread and butter. And that's what I do the podcast on. But the um, the boxing ones obviously came through Spencer. Uh, mm. Spencer's connections are far and wide. You know, as you say, when you were looking around the walls before, I mean, you know, some of the best ones are on the wall. Roy Jones done yeah. him, Roy Jones done him twice. Two, you know, great stories. This, only a couple of years ago, when I had Roy up the last time, he, he insisted on us getting on stage and he rapped to us. I was like, proper cringing with it. But mm. it, that kind of relationship, the first time he came up was comical. I'm all suited and booted for this event. And uh, I got a phone call from Spencer to say, you need to find a, like it was like a pigeon cree or a chicken, like a chicken coop. Um, uh, before Roy goes to the show and I says why he says oh he's banging to his birds you know like when, you say, <laughs> when you say banging to birds normally you're expecting them to want to go down the town after the show Five but it's ten long. he's wanting to trips. <laughs> he's wanting to trips around like a, um, a muddy a muddy like bird sanctuary mm. so I yeah. found one up in Newbiggin with uh, Paul Scott and um, we went up and had a look at these fighting like cockerels and stuff and he's like oh, this is great man and I'm like oh, I'm covered in clots mud going under me suit and me shoes um, Mike Tyson, um, he's obviously my all time favourite fighter. He uh, had him a couple of times up here, aren't you? I had him back to back two years in a row. Um, I remember Spencer telling us what the initial price was first time round, and I was panicking because it for me, I think the most that I ever gambled on a show was like a couple of grand. And this one, you know, you were in like a five figure fee, and I was like, it's never gonna work. And I only had six weeks to pull it round, but I went with my gut instinct and I trusted Spencer. And yeah, we pulled it off, you know, covered Mike's fee, made a bit of profit. And, you know, from my perspective, it was um, it was one of the greatest nights of my life. I'd looked after Mike in Leeds. I'd, I was part of the security team um, when Mike had come to Leeds. 
Um, so I'd met him already, but there's nothing like putting a show on where you're the man in control and yeah. he's, he's coming to you. Um, so the first time, obviously, I met him, he'd, uh, I knew that he was a fan of the Cray twins. And obviously, I you know, I visited I visited the Crays when I was a kid. I visited Ronnie for five years in Broadmoor. I visited Reggie in uh, a, a load of prisons over 10 years. And um, when, when he fought, was it Bruce Selden in Glasgow? I can't remember, it might have been somebody else. But when, when Tyson fought in Glasgow, he um he paid homage to Reggie. Julius France, not Ju- Manchester. Yeah, but I can't remember. He one fought them, somebody. He fought somebody in Glasgow, and he, he came off and he was interviewed on Sky, and he paid tribute to Reggie Cray. Mm. Um, and I thought, wow. So when I had him on in Gateshead, I gave him a copy of a book that I'd written called "The Crays: The Geordie Connection," which was about me, mm. me life and times working for the Crays when they were in prison. And uh, he'd read the book, and the following year he came off the bus, gave us a big hug and then invited us up to his hotel room and we, we sat and chatted for about an hour and that was the time where I was just starting to, to, to go into pro boxing yeah. um, and he gave us some advice, he, you know, he just said that you know, pro boxing's full of sharks, be very careful and it's not like unlicensed boxing where you're in control, you know, you've got a lot of rules and this, that and the other but he says, you know, be very careful, he says there's a lot of people who will be there like, trying to pull your pants down and just, just you know, <laughs> best advice you're going to give us, I mean that, in, 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 now you know. <laughs> But it's life. That's life, and you know yeah. you, that's all walks of life, not just boxing. But yeah, that was that was great. But I mean, Mayweather obviously done him twice again, and yeah. you're astronomical doing Mayweather, different different level again. But with you got um, on with him, didn't you? Yeah, first time I got Pete Graves to interview him, but um, in March this year, before lockdown, was me me very me fi- very final gig. Put him on at the City Hall in Newcastle, mm. and um, he I interviewed him myself. I, I got up and did it myself, and at the end of the show, he came up and asked me for a photo with him. He says, um, he says, you've been the best interviewer on the tour. Um, I'd like to have a photograph. Can, can you come over here? I'll get a microphone and do it like that. So just nice to have that kind of, just that, nice to have that kind of rapport with people. And um, I think from the older fighters, obviously you mentioned Roberto Duran, um, Joe Frazier. I did yeah. the, I did the very last show with Joe before he passed away. God bless him. Um, and Jake Lamotta. Um, I had Jake Lamotta here, which the game only had about a hundred people at that event. I can never understand. Some of the bigger names tend not to bring in, or the older names never bring in a big crowd. But that was just fantastic. Jake he, Lamotta. He yeah, came and did it with his. One. He came and did it with his wife, um, and his wife Jake was ninety when he came Is to he Newcastle. Still alive. Di- dead now. Yeah. He came to Newcastle and um, he was ninety, and his wife was forty-five, and it was called the Lady and the Lady and the Champ tour, and uh, all I remember is the opening line. <laughs> she sat next to him and uh, she went. I know what you guys are thinking, she says, so I just want to start with, um, the, you know, the obvious, I'll get on top. <laughs> and I thought, I thought that's a great, like, it was a great way to open it, but you know, he came with his, he had his cowboy Stetson on, and he, he had all the lines that you would expect him to say, and uh, it's, you know, anyone who's watched Raging Bull, you know, yeah, great, so great, film, great film, to actually meet the person who it's about and, and have that spend that time with them was something I'll never that forget. That must have been the best buzz out of all these than Jake Lamar. Just a legend, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, you never got, you know, just slightly too old to, you know, to meet the likes of Joe Louis, Sonny Liston, who I would like to have met. You know, I'd like to have had a conversation with both of them about the craze, you know, because mm-hmm. obviously the craze brought them to England and did tours with them up and down the country. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, they brought Liston over, didn't they? In the sixties, didn't they? Got some great, great footage of of, of Joe Louis at the Dolce Vita. Um, I've seen it. It's um, it's it, it's in the archives in Middlesbrough, um, where Ronnie Cray's sitting in the front row, clapping, and Joe Louis on stage, and Sammy Letterman's there bringing them down the stairs. But uh, the Chronicle, the local newspaper, sent us some photographs of Sonny Liston in Newcastle, and actually. I'd heard the stories but never seen the footage and he got rode through the horse, uh, rode through the streets of Newcastle on a, on a white horse. So the guy sent us a few photographs of it and it's, uh, it's amazing to see, you know, it was like crowds and crowds of people in Newcastle's streets mm. and Sonny Liston riding through on a white horse. Brilliant man, great, great stuff, mm. great memories. That's brilliant. Tell me about Freddie Foreman then, your relationship with Freddie Foreman, because you, you, you're really good pals, aren't you? You go yeah. to his house a lot and blah, 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 don't you? Came through the craze, really. I mean, obviously, the, the craze thing is a weird scenario. People would be thinking, well, he's too young to be associated with the craze, but, you know, I passed my English exam at school studying the profession of violence by John Pearson. Mm. So my English I read that, I read that when I was at school. My English teacher, Peter Yates, allowed us to use it as part of my final exam curriculum, and I passed my English exam studying that. So I wrote to the craze when I was a kid saying pass me English exam studying your life story just want to say at least something positive has come out of your life 
and they were like um, they were like wow you know thanks thanks for letting me know um, and, and then over a six month period I got into producing t-shirts so I wrote to the craze with a business proposal I said why don't I put your image on some t-shirts and we'll split the money so the deal was done, 70% of them, 30% of me. 30%? <laughs> Sounds bad, but you know, it was 35% for Ron, 35% for Reg, and 30 for me. So it wasn't, it wasn't, as, it wasn't as bad as it sounds. You were all thirds in then, more or less, yeah. But that was me, that was me and my business, my business mind getting cut. Do you know what I mean? I, I started doing business with the craze, and I always say if you can do business with the craze, you can do business with anybody, you know. And over 10 years, I did, you know, I did t-shirts, I did cups, I did calendars, I did mirrors. We did everything apart from, like, Bog roll, you know, because <coughs> apart from bog roll, it wouldn't have been respectful way when you're yeah. on the craze. But it was, um, but yeah, that was that was what we did, and uh, and it became it was really popular. And the internet wasn't really you know around at that point. Computers were, yeah. so I created a database for them because they used to get fan mail. I mean, Reggie was Reggie was averaging four hundred letters a week in prison after the after the film came out in nineteen ninety. They just went, they made more money buying bars than they ever made when they were. Gangsters, outside uh, um so yeah so getting involved with them was uh ronnie cray passed away in 95 and um I, w I was at the funeral i was charlie cray's minder on the day and um went to the governor's pub in the east end for the wake and that's where i met freddie foreman uh, freddie was a pole bearer on the day he was on home he was on home release that day um for for the funeral and charlie cray introduced me to freddie foreman and that was it. We we hit it off then. We're, we're never that close then. But then when he got out of prison, there was a getting out party. I was invited to that. And then I, I just essentially hit it off with Fred. You know what I mean? And there was a couple of situations I had where I picked the phone up to him. He held us out. And, um, you know, he never wanted a favour back. Um, I think because I've always been honest, I'm not a gangster. I'm not a criminal. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not you know, crime in any way. But I can always make a few quid, whether it's making t-shirts or whether it's making a book or giving them a little bit of an in with somebody who makes documentaries. And that's how my relationships flourished. So a couple of years ago, um, me and his godson, Christian Simpson, we did a, we set up our own production company. We did a documentary with Salon Pictures and Lionsgate took the distribution on, simply called Fred. It's the, it's the that's the one I've got. Oh, I thought it was brown bread, Fred. It's just Fred. Just Fred. It? Just yeah. a d it's it's, it's the, like a red background, isn't it, on the DVD? Yeah. It's just the defining documentary. And you produced it, obviously. Yeah, we. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that was great for us. And is um, that who took it on Lionsgate then? Cause Lionsgate it, distributed it. Yeah, yeah so, massive, aren't they? So that's how we got onto um, that's how we got onto Netflix and all yeah, that. You did all right out last Steve, didn't you? <laughs> to be honest, not as well as you would have hoped. <laughs> not as well as you would have We we got it. We got a nice advance, but um, another one of the comp the company that was handling it sadly went bust uh q productions who were involved and yeah we'll, we'll not say another penny off that but it was yeah. never it was never was really it? about the money yeah it was about getting that documentary done because it leads to other things leads to other things and, and and we managed to get a sit down with ray burdus who produced the craze love on Renault bay um you know amongst other things he's just done a film which i'm in called to be someone which is quadrophenia 2 mm. um and you know he's he's on the he's he's back on the go. So we got him to write the script. He's written the script about Fred. Uh, so we're working we're working now on the finance, and, and that's that's a, that's a big project. So I was the DVD. You have to wait for don't you have to wait for it all to be carved up. It takes a, a good yeah. couple of years, doesn't it? The Filming it's the easy bit because you, yeah. you you can make a film or a documentary. Yeah, paid off it, innit? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we got an advance, which is good. We are screwed while loaves on. We have got a good advance um, off the documentary. With films, it's different. You need. For, for something like Fred, it's got to be a good budget. You know what I mean? Mm. You're, you're talking millions of pounds to make a film, to make and, and make it right. And and, and Fred's film's got to be right. So we're hoping it's you know it's got to be of the quality of maybe's Legend with Tom Hardy. Mm. You know some of these other career films that are being made. Good good to watch if you're interested in the careers, but they're low budget. But mm. you, you want it to be that level because it's Fred, and he's he's probably one of the last to have a film he made about him one, he? from yeah. that era. Out of all that, them boys. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So, I mean, from from my perspective, great to be involved, and, and great to be helping Fred, you know, you know, achieve his dream. We want to get him on that uh, that red carpet, you know. The, well, my opinion of Freddie Foreman, because obviously people like that growing up, and they they were like big heroes to me. You know, you you'd see him on news and that when he got dragged off that plane. And yeah. They were poster boys for uh, London villains, South London villains that went to. Uh, Marbella and Spain is it on the run? They they were like the the thorn in the government side at the time. You know, we're going back 
40 year, aren't we? 35 year, but I always, I always thought they were rascals, but they, had, they did it with a twinkle in the eye, didn't they? And Different era, really. I yeah. mean, you know, I, I was only down at Fred's the other day. We had a, you know, we had a couple of bottles of wine, me, him, and Christian, and uh, we just popped in the same. First time we've been able to see him since lockdown, you know. Yeah. Um, we had a great night, but. Every time we have one of those nights, there's a, there's a few reminiscences about you know different times. We always hear a story we haven't heard, um, but you know some stories I've heard time and time again. But you're right, it's a, it's that certain era. And if there's one time I would like to go back to, if you, if you could get in a time machine and go back and have a night or a day in a particular era, it's just to go down the Prince of Wales that Freddie used to run in the 1960s and just go and have a night out with him. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And go to the 211 club in Ballam or or maybe pop over to the Regency that the Crays had or pop into the Blind Beggar and see what it was like back in them days. You know what I mean? And you know, just just to have a walk around London would be fascinating. And then, well, it, double R club. Uh, right? Double R, R yeah, born. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but just, you know, it would be great to be able to just do that. You know what I mean? Yeah. See Freddie in his prime as well. Do you know what I mean? Because he was a bit of a boy. You know, pop into his boxing gym where he... You know, he, did a bo he did box as well, didn't he, Fred? Didn't he? he boxed on a show um, at one of the swimming baths down there, and he um, he got put in by his promoter and manager against somebody who he should never have boxed. Um, but the uh, the fight was a classic, and he you know all the nubbins got chucked in, and he um, he never got a penny out of the nubbins. By the way, he's still he's still bitter about that. Yeah. But uh, he had a decent he had a decent little career, but it was never one that was ever going to take off, and you know. Because he got put in against such a high, a high ranking, um, a high ranking fighter at the time, he was always then going to get put in against those fighters, especially winning fight of the night on this yeah. particular bill, you know. Um, so yeah, he, he did, and, and the careers had boxing careers. I mean, um, I collect a lot of that memorabilia, you know. I mean, I've got like you have six fights, one of them. What, what, both, yeah. Reggie had seven. A um, couple of little things I've got. I mean, I own, I own the, uh, I own the boxing gloves from the Ampro publicity, publicity shot. Um, I've got when Reggie was English champion, boys champion of the world. He got a certificate from from the from there, and he got a he also got a badge um, to to put on his shorts. Well, I own both of them. I own the I own the ticket of uh, the, t the the dad's ticket from when all three crazes boxed at the Albert Hall. Yeah. Loads of little things, little quirky things that that you always mm. people will go. They mean a lot to you, but somebody else might not mean much to you. Anybody who's into the craze would love would love. Yeah. There's always a battle between us collectors. You'll see something come up, and you're like, oh, you know, whether it's on eBay or if it's somebody who's selling it. But, um, but yeah, I, you know, it's nice to have those kind of mementos. A lot of that kind of stuff doesn't really mean a great deal to me, you know, because I see it all at these events. Do you know what I mean? I see, you know, like signed signed boxing gloves and that. It's a ten a penny to me. You were in Blunderstone before me, uh, Reggie. Reggie, yeah, yeah I visited them there. And uh, when I were in the next cell to the one you were in when I, when I finished off my last big sentence, and people were saying that was Reggie Craze. Yeah. Uh, so there, and that other one down there, uh, behind, were in that one in the party because they behind got two stretched, didn't he? Uh, it's but, um, uh, yeah. I mean, it was a sad end of the craze. Like they were never gonna, they were never gonna let him out, though. You know, mm. and I mean, obviously, it took cancer to, to get a. You got, did he get out for fifteen days? Yeah, he got cancer. He got diagnosed with cancer and ended up getting out. And had a, he had a little bit of freedom, which is better than none. But I mean, he didn't have didn't have any health to to appreciate it. He was stuck in a hotel room in Norwich before he died. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but um, but yeah, some people would say that's deserved for what he did. But mm. um, they only ever killed their own. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Taking a life's not acceptable. I couldn't condone what they did. But mm. you know, if if they hadn't killed, if you hadn't killed Jack the Hat, Jack the Hat would have killed them. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's it's one of them. Can uh, you get involved in that life, in it? Yeah, you, you mm. that's it. You reap what you sow, and karma comes back to get you. I'm afraid. Yeah. Uh, moving on then, you, uh, the scripts and everything's done for the Freddie Foreman feature yeah. film. That you uh, and you ju you're just waiting now for the financing. That is you all ready to go with that. That's the hard part. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, you, once you get the financing, the casting starts. We're already thinking. You know, obviously we can't say who we're looking at at the minute, yeah. but that, that's already thought of. But the script's the key. You get a good script, then you get financing, and you get somebody with a track record like Ray Burdis behind it. Yeah. Then then you're not going to struggle. Um, you know, so Ray's but Ray's written the script. So, so Ray Burns has done the script, he's the one who did the one with Martin Kemp is it? Yeah. and Gary Kemp, he, the original, was it 1989? Yeah, 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 but I mean, they're probably the two big ones that people are remembering for. And uh, as I said, to be someone which comes out later this year, which has been dubbed Quadrophenia 2, because there's a lot of the yeah. original cast in it. 
I'm in it as well. Uh, comes out later this year, so yeah, I'm I'm hoping it's going to be uh, I hope it's going to be something which we'll be getting my teeth into next year. Yeah. Uh, tell me about the books you've wrote, Steve, because you've wrote 17 books, haven't you? Yeah, mainly crime. Um, stuff, main, yeah. Mainly crime books, yeah. Um, you know, the, the Craze, the Geordie Connection, of course, is about my relationship with the Craze. Um, and I, I started writing that in 95 when Ronnie died. Mm. I just remember going over the Bow Flyover. I was part of the cortege, obviously, I was at Charlie Craze Minder. Mm. And it was getting, you know, there was work being done on the Bow Flyover. And I just remember the, the workmen taking their hard hats off. And I was thinking, this is like surreal. Do you know what I mean? This is Ronnie Cray, he's a gangster, and there's like mm. hundreds of people turning out for his funeral. It's, it just felt a bit surreal. So, so yeah, I mean, that was, I started making notes, and then when Reggie and, you know, when I got I got them done, in, I got the book more or less finished in 1999, and um, I sent a copy to Charlie, who was in prison by then. I sent a copy to Reg, and they both liked it, and they both said that it'll do well. And then within a year, they were both dead. Uh, so the book came out. The book didn't actually come out in two thousand and three. It was finished. It was finished in nineteen ninety nine. But there's a lot of work had to be done. I've got a kid involved called Stu Wheatman who uh, helped put us together. And uh, this one, and then mainly crime books. I suppose the ones that stand out are the Sears book. Obviously, the Sears, um, you know, crime family in Newcastle. I'd got to know them on the doors. And he got fifteen years, didn't he? When I, in ninety one, I remember being in Ulm, and I remember hearing his name that he was armed um, robbers, were they? Yeah, they, I mean, um, years, I they got 10, both Mike, Stephen and Michael got 10 for um, blackmail. Mm. Um, it was local businessmen up in, up in the North East. Uh, that was the main thing. But yeah, I mean, they were suspected of, of armed robberies. They were suspected of murder. You know, mm. there's a lot of things that were linked with, but were never proven. I heard a good st a story, a funny story uh, when I was in prison about John Sayers that they were on the phone and they were bang up eight o'clock at night and the screw says, bang up. And he says, here. And I'm on phone. And he stayed on phone about an hour. Did he? <laughs> then banged up, yeah. All the screws were all stood round and uh, he waited while he finished on phone. So obviously they didn't want to turn the phones off, did they? Yeah, I didn't. <laughs> but John That's respect for you though, isn't it? I suppose, John, isn't John's it? um yeah, John's a great lad. Uh, got to know John, you know, again. Are they are they still they're out of prison and that aren't they? They're oh they're still out, yeah. Which round, is good. Round Newcastle, yeah. But they're always living under the fear that at some point the police might, uh, police might the, the police, police will do something which will affect that freedom. But um yeah, yeah I've enjoyed writing the book. It was based on Stephen's life, the Sears mm -hmm. tried and tested at the highest level. Um, I've just finished another one which comes out uh, at the end of September, Operation Sears. Lockdown's allowed us to get that finished, so mm. there's, been a, there's been a bit of a silver line into this. I'm, I'm now back on with the books. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm now halfway through Paul Massey's book, which I'm writing with, I'm writing with a family. Um, Kelly Massey and Lindsay Massey, his, his two daughter, his two daughters. Um, yeah. A bit disappointed that there's another book coming out um, about him, and um, they, they wanted to counteract it before it comes out. So they want to put the true story about their dad out there from their perspective. Mm -hmm. So we're working on that, which is called a Salford a Salford Heart. Um, but yeah, Paul Ferris, the wee man, uh, worked with him on his book, on his last book, Unfinished Business, uh, which was quite good. Um, you know, I've enjoyed that. I'm working with. Um, Freddie Foreman, obviously, on different projects. We've done a couple of small books with him. Charlie Salvador, who used to be Charlie Bronson. Um, this year, we released a poetry book with him. I wrote a few poems. He'd written a few poems. He put his artwork in for his. He drew artwork for mine and artwork for his. Again, just a small collector's item book, which he, you know, which which is signed by him. Um, so just loads of little projects. Um, the big ones, are obviously, the ones where you know there's a bigger gamble, but you make more money. Um, but yeah, I'm, you know, I'm busy working with you know a lot of other people on, on potential other projects. It's just whether it's whether you know whether they'll see the light of day. It's, it's a tough it's a tough thing to do. Write books. It, it's very time consuming. You've got to be focused. Um, you've got to have the right subject matter. I get I get manuscripts all the time. You can sit down sometimes and you just can't get no out of your head. You get mental yeah. blocks. You mental get block. Yeah, I have that every morning. <laughs> <laughs> Cup of tea sorts that out. Yeah, yeah. But it, but yeah. you know it's. It, it, it's it's part it's part and parcel of me. I enjoy doing it, um, you know, and, and and because I've got the trust of the the different villains mm. um, up and down the country, then you know it, it tends to be crime books that that, mm. that I end up doing, and I get a bit of stick for it. I get a bit of stick on social media, you know, the craze things always thrown at us, um, you know, by trolls. But for me, trolls are all part and parcel of it. You put your head above the parapet. You're always going to get people who don't like you, and I've always described I've always described myself as somebody who's like Marmite, and yeah. um, 
I think that comes across. Uh, uh, I got approached by a, another author called Jamie Boyle who wanted to do a book about me, um, and I, f I said, well, I don't think it'll sell, but he yeah. says it will. So I allowed him to do it. Well. And it's called Every Boy's Dream, and that's out there now. But that's mainly about me football, me me, me following Newcastle, and you know the 25 years of being a, a, an outspoken person on Newcastle United. Somebody in the club. Mm -hmm. Are you not outspoken about Newcastle? Oh, very outspoken. What about this uh, this guy who owns it now? What, what, why is he why is he not putting money into the club? Well, actually, he's, that's so, somebody who doesn't own it. Mike probably. actually Mike actually spent a lot of money in this last couple of weeks. We're beginning to wonder whether he's robbed a bank. Um, but he's yeah he's he's not been the most popular of owners. But I have known owners who've been less popular. Um, oh, yeah. What yeah. about the guy with Lord Westwood with a Lord Westwood with the eye patch? Um, he was probably one of the worst, I think, in in the club's history. Then we had Gordon McKeague, who was like it was all about spending the, the family silver. God, you know it off by heart. Don't yeah. You what about the guy? John Hall. John Hall. John, John Hall was great. So John's a good pal of mine. Um, yeah. They still get people slagging him off because he's a Tory, but but he he did the best the best you know, really job. Pulled it off, didn't he, when Keegan was there? Yeah. He did the best job for us, but. Um, I've got to be honest, we always get looked at as deluded supporters, but the way I always see it is, you know, we're, we're just passionate about our club. There's yeah. clubs in a lot worse state, and again, getting we're always getting back to the pandemic whenever we do these kind of interviews, but I fear for a lot of the smaller clubs, do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's like because a small old boxing, isn't it, and big promoters and small ones, you know? We've got a 52,000 seater stadium. At the minute, if they do let supporters back in, you're looking at potentially 7,000 fans being allowed oh, back in St right. James's Park. Now, how on earth are Newcastle going to make that work? But it's not poor me, poor us. You look at teams like Bournemouth, or you know, who've just been relegated, Huddersfield, maybe yeah. teams that have dropped out the Premier League recently who have been hit massively through their finances. How are they going to survive? How is a team like Bolton going to survive, who are going through a tough time financially anyway, or Charlton, who are going... And these are established teams. What's going to happen to them if, they don't, if they're only allowed... X percent of their, their crowd in their grounds aren't as big as ours. I don't understand how it's going to work. And you're going to see clubs full. You've seen it at non league level now. Um, Manchester, there was one, Droylton, who were in the same league as Dunstan, um, the National League, gone. Club like Droylton, who's been around for years, gone, just dead because they can't afford to go on anymore. Harlepool down the road, um, paid jobs at the club have now become volunteer jobs. They're asking for volunteers to go and do office jobs at, at Hartlepool because they haven't got the money to pay them. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, they're non-league they're non now. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's frightening. You're going to see a lot of clubs, a lot of history, if this continues, which I believe it will, just go out of business. So what, our, our small problem at the minute is we want to be one of the richest clubs in the world because we want Saudi, Saudi money in. We're not being allowed to do it. But, you know, in the grand scheme of things, at least we're still going to have a football club to go to and support yeah. But it's um yeah you know it's I love I love talking about Newcastle but yeah I you know I am controversial because I've got an opinion my opinion is different to another fan's opinion is different to another fan's opinion but I try to be balanced um but again the pandemic allowed us to do a podcast it's not something I'd ever thought about doing up until the pandemic and then I just started going on Instagram and I started going through my little black book and going I oh, see whether he'll come on and do an hour's chat. See whether she'll come on and do an hour's chat. And I got them on and I started started coming on and I was getting, you know, I was getting 1,500, 1,600 people watching. And I thought, right, I'll move it back onto YouTube because I'd done a couple of things on YouTube which had never took off. And people migrated from Instagram onto YouTube, they subscribed. I've got 32,000 subscribers now. And for me, that's great, you know. I've got, on average, six, six and a half thousand people watch the shows each night. Um, and I've been doing one a night. Seven and eight. On your, on your podcast? On yeah. my YouTube, yeah. So, But I do different shows each night. Yeah. So, Monday night's Ladies Night. I have Newcastle female fans on talking. And are they queuing up to get on, Steve? I do. I just do this. I do a certain... they queuing up for you? No, I just <laughs> queuing up to get on. Choose the night. your job apparel uh, top. Johnny yeah. Owen, where's my job apparel <laughs> top? I'm still waiting. Jab, Jab's been great. Cross paths. They, yeah. is, they, they help us as well. But yeah, Tuesday night I get a local journalist on. Wednesday night, to, which is today, I do yeah. Super Mac, former Newcastle legend. And I'm going to say it's a Super Mac. I've seen a programme on Superstars. He did 100 metres in 10.8. Yeah. Which, like, Michael Owen were just a fraction quicker. And look at the, the years difference. Mental, isn't it? 
and, and he were in the 70s and Owen were in, he did his in the 90s so he yeah. used to be in quick because Michael Owen were like lightning one before he got that injury we discussed it we discussed it uh, a couple of weeks ago on the show well, actually Mark yeah, oh, you, mean, you imagine him now he'd be 150 million wouldn't he talk, talking about it on the show and he was talking obviously Keegan fell off the bike that's well well publicised on superstars, superstars yeah. And, <laughs> yeah 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 there was no love lost between him and Kevin for, for some reason uh, yeah, but, you know why don't you because didn't he score five for England in yeah. the match? And Keegan said to him, all right, that's f***ing enough now. Pass the ball to the rest of us. <laughs> I remember it, yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's it's great just to do it. I enjoy doing it. I mean, you know, if, if things ever get back to normal, I, I don't think I'll be able to do seven a week. But, um, but that's yeah. That's a lot, that, Steve, seven. I've, I've, enjoyed, I've enjoyed doing it. And again, because... We all need to, we all need to pay the bills. Yeah. Monetizing it with adverts, it's there and it, you know, I know there's, no, there's no people people have a little pop about my channel with adverts coming on that it's it's nothing in it. There's, there's no there's no it's just, there's it's no easy. money in it, is there? It's People easy to skip. Clothes, it? It's easy to skip. I mean, I know you've got a sponsor. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. I haven't asked for sponsors yet. Yeah. I think, I think you know, now we've established it and people enjoy it. I might start putting it out there and seeing if anybody wants to sponsor the show. Yeah. And yeah. we're more than happy to do that, which would be great. But yeah, if anybody, if any Newcastle fans are watching, just go on to Steve Wraith on YouTube and there, there's a channel there for, for you to watch Newcastle stuff. Mm. You know what I mean? But I think we've all, we've all, we can all go out and do stuff. It's just... Yeah, we've we've got a you, you draw from Sheffield to come to me today, and it's yeah. all about yeah, it's all about putting a little bit of time and effort in, you know. Yeah, it's not uh, it's not easy for me. This isn't my channel; it's a non-profit one. It's more of a hobby. Yeah, yeah. it didn't cost me anything in expenses, whereas before it, it did do for a few for three years, two and a half year. Mm -hmm. But people seem to think, oh, you've got to just skip it if you don't like the advert, just skip them. It takes a second, doesn't it? To of course, do. it does. Yeah, it's not that inconvenient. But. Uh, the, the your podcast uh, there's another one in the, in the in the area is it uh true geordie or something that, yeah he's that's done that's a good podcast isn't God, it, he's that? done he's done well i mean you know i got to meet him a few years ago he came to meet me he's a big lump isn't he he came to meet me and wanted a photo with me i used to run a bar in newcastle called the number nine bar we used to do pre-match talkings and uh my mate kappa brought him up to see us from jarrah and um, he was just starting out then I've got to be honest, I didn't really like what he was doing because he, he became famous for ranting and raving about Newcastle and effing and blinding. And he's a Newcastle fan. Oh, he's a Newcastle fan, but he was effing and blinding and, you know, that's what got him the ratings. That's what got him popular. There's people going, have a look at this bloke and, you know, look at this, look at this, look at this. And, and it just grew and grew and grew. And now, millionaire of it. Do you know what I mean? Is he a millionaire? Then? Yeah, because he's, well, millions of subscribers. He's, you know, the views he gets are, the views he gets are astronomical. Yeah. Um, not something I've even thought of on my channel, but yeah. you know, it, you know, you, you put yourself out there, you put yourself above the parapet, and you know, you talk about football. It's you know, you can make something out of it, which is good. You know what I mean? And and, and yeah, I monetize my channel. Don't think there's anything wrong with that. I'm sitting here at the minute where normally I'd be turning over my money, making you know, doing events. I can't do that. Yeah. So got to find another way of paying the bills and you know, keeping me me wife and me kids to the life they're accustomed to. You know. All right. Uh, moving on then, Steve. Uh, what do you think about Tommy Hearns? You've had him, you've had him on one of your shows. What were you like? Massive puncher, wasn't he? Massive puncher, yeah. I mean, you know, anyone who's watched the, the got a squeaky voice as well, hasn't he? Anyone who's watched <laughs> the Fantastic Four, um, you know, like you know, you, you had like your Hearns, your Sugar Ray, and your Duran. Great era of boxing, but. You know, he was he was at the end of the tour, so we didn't have a great. I wouldn't say we had a great experience. Who were you all with, with, with the Spencer, promoters? Spencer, and Gold right. Gold Star, who were yeah. doing the tour at the time, and um, you know, they always ring me up and say we've got some X, X Y, and Z coming. Who do you want to book in? Um, and and Tommy Hearns was just one, one who I hadn't had. You know, I'm, I I only need um, I only need Hearns. Um, no, I've done Hearns. I've never done Hagler. Hagler's the only one I've done. He only does two shows a year. So I'm trying to get him to the northeast at some point, you know, within the next couple of years. But yeah, Hearns was okay, but we got him at the end of the tour, so he wasn't the liveliest, he wasn't great. But um, look, once they get on stage, they're always they're always up for it. Um, I think Chris Eubank, I did Chris Eubank once, and uh, I mean, a weird situation. I went to London to cement the deal. Um, he wasn't working at the time with Spencer um, and Goldstar. I went to London, told Spencer I was going down, went to meet Eubank, and it was... It was on the premise of getting him to come and do a talk in, but the guy who took us down with him also wanted to do a golf day. And um, I think the first thing I remember about Eubank was walking into the Grosvenor Hotel, going in and sitting down and having this meeting with him. And there he is sitting there like that. And I'm looking going, 
I thought it was an act. Do you know, like when I watched him on TV, but that's what he's like in real life. Do you know what I mean? He, he is exactly the way he is, and he's like, like a peacock, and he's sitting like that and looking, and the way he talks and everything. But what a great chat. Agreed on the agreed on the deal for the dinner, and then my mate goes, and then the next day, if you don't mind, he says, would you be would you be alright to come and tee off for this for this golf competition? We just need you for like that first hour, etc. He went, aha, but that is another day. So you wanted another day, Tommy. You bank. Oh, you bank. You wanted yeah. another day's wages. You wanted another day's wages. You bank. So he ended up, um, yeah, he, he he basically ended up, you know, not doing the golf day and came and did the dinner for me, but he was late. On the dinner, he got there late. I heard it's a nightmare because she'll bank senior. He arrived at the um, he arrived at the venue. And bearing in mind, I've been to London. Mm. I've been to meet him. I've um, done the deal with him. I'm then on the phone and by email. I'm the one. I'm the one paying him the deposit. I'm on the phone to him. I'm texting him. So we're in touch all the way through. Mm. He turns up at the venue on the night time, and he goes, "I went, hi Chris, how are you, mate?" He goes, "I'm very well." And and who are you? I'm the one who's me, I'm the, you know, it's me, Steve, you know, it, it wasn't as if I had some kind of dramatic change, you know, I've never had, <laughs> I haven't got a full head of hair, I haven't suddenly, like, <laughs> shaved it off. You're not going to turn him back to him up first. No, for God's sake, <laughs> but, but it, it was just, uh, you know, I was like, God, this is ridiculous, but he was late, he, he got in late, he got to the venue, um, he got on stage, he told everyone he had a cold, uh, um, at, you know, on the microphone, I was like, God, you're setting people up for a great night here, and then yeah. he wanted to go back to the hotel. And the best thing was he went back to the hotel, had a security guy take him back to the hotel. Um, he went to the hotel, he wanted to go upstairs and get changed. He came back down in the lift, and as he came down in the lift, Chelsea Football Club was staying at the hotel at the same time. And Jose Mourinho, the manager, was going into the lift as Chris Eubank was coming out. And Jose went, oh, Chris, put his hand out, and Eubank just walked straight past him. Blanked him. Did you, did you know we were? Well, probably not. We didn't know who I was, and I'm paying him his money. Um, but yeah, just great stories. But he come there, uh, you know, joking aside, he got to the event, and when he got to the event, he was one of the best speakers we've had. He just mm. commanded, commanded silence, commanded respect. Some of these dudes you go out there when people are mumbling away, talking, people were just engrossed in everything he said. Great speaker, fantastic, you know, fantastic entertainer, and he was as a fighter. Um, but as a speaker, he's really, really good. So I um, mean, you know, would I have him back? Yeah, I'd probably have him back at some point. I think next year, all being well, and we get back to normal. I think uh, Spencer is looking at putting on Ben and New Bank together, which uh, we're, which we're going to do in the northeast. Would you? What would Nigel Ben like then? Going from New Bank to Ben, what would he? Would he? Would he have a good night? Got on, got on very well with Nigel. I've worked with Nigel four times. Um, I've done Nigel on his own uh, twice. I've done Nigel with. Steve Collins and I've done Nigel with uh, Connor, so gone the full spectrum. Um, probably the best the best night that I had with him was was with Collins. Him and Collins bounce off each other and they're really good. Um, it depends when I, Nigel went religious when I did Ben and Collins. So I wasn't comparing that night, and the person who was comparing allowed Nigel to go on more about religion than he did about boxing, that which can, it, spoils it for people. Um, you know, we all want to hear about his turn into God, but you want to hear about his fights. Do you know what I mean? That's what yeah, that's what people are there his for. His lifestyle. <laughs> so I ended yeah. up. So, I, so when I've interviewed him, we've always talked about that. So yeah, but the one I did with, with him and Connor um, was was really good. Connor was just thinking about becoming pro. Uh, he was he was only seventeen, and him and his twin sister were here um, as part of the tour with Nigel. And uh, they both wanted tattoos, so I managed to get them into a tattoo parlour. And they both got their very first tattoos in Newcastle, Connor and his sister. And um, his mum went mental, because they both got, it, they both got a, a tattoo down there. You look, at, you look at Connor now, he's covered in tattoos. Covered them, yeah. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it was a good night, and I've got a little bit of footage of Connor sparring with his dad in Newcastle as we're walking through the street, which is, which is hilarious, you know. First time he'd ever, I'd ever seen him, you know, throwing a punch in anger. But he, um, yeah, great, great, great guy to have on. Um, talked about his past, talked about his involvement with the Essex boys. Um, you know, obviously I'm good friends with Carlton Leach. I know Carlton very well. And he, you know, he used to be involved, him and Tony Tucker used to be involved in the training camps. And yeah. used to go across to Tenerife and train with him. And uh, yeah, Nigel, I mean, he's turned his life around. But I mean, you know, you know, back in the day, he was popping pills and God knows what, wasn't smoking he? Smoking weed, smoking Smoke. 20 pence in a day. Um, and then, you know, getting yourself fit and going into, going into battle, you know, but uh, 
Probably another one in, in, is, is it for English fighters, you know, probably one of my favourites, you know, I mean, the Dark Destroyer, you know, great nights, great memories, and, you know, when I'd started to go and watch boxing live as well, you know what I mean, to get the opportunity to see him was, was great, you know. The only downside of watching Ben was, was in Newcastle, of course, when he came up and... You got beat by Malinga. Sugar Boy, Sugar Boy Malinga, it was a horrendous, horrendous fight. Prince Nazim was there, I think, He dropped well. him in 12th, though, didn't he? Yeah, just wasn't a very good fight. Um, you know, it was. It, it was, was a bit flat that night. Wasn't it was it? a damp squib, damp squib. You know, there's been big, bigger and better nights obviously since with, with the likes of Ritson on and uh, mm. Stewie Hall's nights up there as well. Were always good, you know. Stewie Hall. Yeah, <laughs> Stuart, Stuart, Stewie Hall. I mean, he's a Darlington, Darlington lad. He won a world title with Dennis. I was there at Leeds. Yeah, yeah I, I came down and, and watched it. Dennis sort of there's a ticket out, which was which was kind of him. And um, yeah, it was a, it was a fantastic night to be able to go and you know see see him lift the title was was fantastic. But yeah, you, you never get again somebody a bit like Nigel Ben Stewie lived a colourful life. You know what I mean? Mm. Doing the A's and that in a beef there, and you know you know then to, to suddenly turn your life around, become a fighter, and, and get to that level. Um, you know you got to take your hat off to him. But another another credit to the area, credit to the sports Stewie Hall. What's he doing now, Stuart? Well, I mean, he always threatens he's coming back. He had he had problems with his back, didn't he? He had, he had that surgery. Um, you know, he's, he's training, still keeping fit, spending time with his family, which obviously, you know, you, you struggle to do when you're in the yeah. gym all the time. Um, you know, talk of potentially setting a gym up at some point. I know um, good friends with Pete Shepperson, who trains all my fighters down in uh, Darlington. So, yeah. um, you know, never say never. Um, but again, because of what's going on at the minute with the pandemic, you know, who knows? Who knows what anybody will be doing in the next twelve months? Mm. What do you think to Dave Allen knocking the Uwe Fury fight back? I find it a bit strange in a pandemic. I find it a bit strange that he's done that. You know, I thought. You know, I've met Dave a couple of times. Obviously, he's been on the matchroom shows. He's he's well respected in the northeast. Mm. Mick Marsman's obviously involved with him as well. Um, I think Dave. You know, without knowing him really well just as an observer i think he just has battles every day he gets up you know what i mean yeah. we, you know we all have we all have a cross to bear we all have mental issues depends um, what mo do you think it depends what sort of mood he's in when mtk said do you want to fight you and he said how much and they said x amount and he's gone i want more and just, the next day obviously yeah. he said he got up and then he's rung him and said oh, i have that fight and he said oh well we don't know what's going on now. Do you think it might be? It's politics, isn't it? Yeah. Pol boxing, boxing politics is a bit of a nightmare. Yeah. Um, I, you know, you've got to sometimes, um, sometimes you've got to, you know, swallow your pride. Um, you should never cut your nose off to spite your face in boxing. Um, I've done it probably once. I think I've probably got one out, one outstanding issue in in the whole in the whole fight game um, with one kid up here whose fighter refused to fight on one of my shows because a belt hadn't turned up. And I'll never forgive the kid. Um, I'm not going to mention his name. Um, everybody in the northeast knows who he is. Um, but I'm really disappointed in, in in you know his reaction. And then when he he accepted he accepted really that his fighter had done wrong to me on the phone and said he would put a retraction out on Facebook and he didn't do it. I'm 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 really annoyed about that. And I'll never never forgive the kid and never work with him and never work with any of his fighters. But mm. <clears throat> people might say that I'm not practicing what I preach. But I just think. You shouldn't cut your nose up to spite your face because your fighters might always need that opportunity. Do you know what I mean? And I've had issues with with people. I've had issues with companies or promoters. But you've always got to think one step ahead. You know, I could be spoiling something for Ellis. I could be spoiling something for Anthony Ormsby. I could be spoiling something for Lawrence Osuweki or or, or Shannon Bo, my female fighter, Billy Smith, who who I still currently look after, Steve Cooper. All of these people, they're all relying on me mm. to get them a shot at a fight or you know a, a bill a bill or whatever and if i'm not speaking to him or if i'm not speaking to him that means that they're affected do you know what mm. i mean and that's a problem and you've got to play the game in boxing and uh, dave allen you know it's it's a, it's a fight which makes sense but you know as you say one morning you wake up you, you don't know what his financial situation is and you know he might have woke up and then the offer might have been poor. You know, nobody goes in with the best offer. Like when you're well, a Peter Fury offered him twenty five grand out of Ewey's purse on top of what Matchroom offered him, and they mm. still couldn't get out of that line. A lot of people. I mean, again, Peter's a good pal of mine. Got to know him quite well. You know, he's good friends with with the CS family as well. Um, I think with Peter offering that, that's great. But you know, it just depends who's who's in who's in Dave's here. 
Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, who's, yeah. who's telling, who's advising Dave? Dave's his own man, he can make his own decisions, but Dave's got a team around him, and um, you know, people will be, people will all be looking at, you know, the situation from their perspective as well as Dave's perspective, you know? It depends who you've got around you. If yeah. you've got the right person around you, then, then it, it, it does make does make a big difference in boxing, you know. Um, but it's uh, you should never let yourself be influenced by people. You should always make your own mind up in boxing. What about uh, Dave knocking the bar back? No, oh, I know. For yeah, mega money. I know. I'm asking for a, a lot more. <laughs> it's, it's madness. It, it depends what you. It depends what you see your worth as, though. Do you know what I mean? And you know, he's done. He's not won a belt, has he? He's yeah. done. He's done well. But as you say, he hasn't won. He hasn't won a belt. He's capable of winning one, yeah. you know, and that that division is is one where anybody can beat anybody. Do you know what I mean? We've got we've got a few divisions like that. Um, on another night, he could have knocked David Price, Sparko in three rounds, Dave Allen. Exactly. On, on another night, you, that's the beauty of boxing, though. You don't know. You, you, you just you Anyways, never know. Yeah. When you go when you go into that heavyweight division, it, it it it's always been the most exciting. Do you know what I mean? That's why yeah, Larry Holmes, yeah, your Mike Tyson's, yeah, mm. Evander Holyfield's, yeah, George Foreman's, Riddick Bow, Riddick Bow, you you name it. Even some of the even even some of the, the other ones like Buster Douglas. Do you know what I mean? That that Buster Douglas Tyson fight is still talked about to this day. You know what I mean? And you know, watching Tyson's recent like show that he's one man show. He talked about it. He you know he went into that fight. He didn't prepare and he he took you know he he took. Yeah, he took him for granted that he was just going to turn up and win, and it's just one of them things. It's he got up, did he? Busted up with some that uppercut, didn't he? Yeah, it's the beauty. It's the beauty of heavyweight boxing. We've seen it with Wilder and Fury. You know what I mean? With with Wilder sparking Fury and him having the like the Undertaker return and then completely mullering him in the second fight. Yeah. What's going to happen in the third fight? There's no guarantee the Fury's going to win. Fury, Wilder could catch him with a one in the first round. You know what I mean? We're, we're just. You don't know that's the beauty of heavyweight boxing but yeah i mean you're right with dave um you know he's he's not he's not won a belt um but there's, that's not to say that in a year's time he, he might not have a belt around his waist yeah we'll, we'll talk about the wilder fury third fight then do you think that al Heyman is playing playing the game and dragging it out a little bit to see if fury implodes or yeah that's while but... wilder's confidence gets built up or Everybody's doing that. Everybody's doing that. Matchroom's doing it with um with Joshua. You know the mm. Matchroom Matchroom have to protect Anthony Joshua because mm. he's the kingpin. Yeah, that's he's, why they're not announcing pool left fight, isn't it? They're yeah. dragging it out, aren't they? He's the, he is Matchroom. Anthony Joshua is Matchroom. Um all of these other fighters are fairly insignificant because Anthony's the one that pulls And he's the only pay per view star really, isn't he, technically? Yeah, he is. You can't say Dylan White, but he hasn't fought for European has he? No. And, and that is the that is the center of matchrooms industry at the minute yeah. and, and what happens when anthony joshua retires who knows you know what i mean it'll be interesting to see um but yeah i think with 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 wilder and fury i understand rematches have to be you know rematch closes have to be in there um but you know fury really we all know he's beaten him twice but he hasn't he got a draw he's won one there needs to be a third doesn't it there? there does need to be a third there does need to be a third fight um, you know, it's when that takes place, and then it's who he fights. And it's I think what people get sick about in heavyweight boxing is that there's too many there's too many titles. Yeah. You know, you've got you've got your WBA, your WBC, but then you've got like an ex, you've got this one, you've got that one. It's just it's starting to become a farce. It was becoming a farce years ago when Tyson mm. and that was there because you wanted to see Tyson fight Lewis. You know, you, you wanted to see him fight him when when he was supposed to fight. It's, it's they put these fights off, and now now you've got people contracted. To different promoters, it just makes it all a farce and difficult. We, you're, they're all hoping that Tyson Fury goes on another binge. He gets back on something which he shouldn't. He gets back on the drugs, or he gets back on the drink, or whatever. And they're hoping he, he has a mental collapse. The biggest test was lockdown for him. He, he sailed through it. Yeah. He's got the right people around him. He's got the right team around him. He's got the. He's, he's been spending more time with the family, which is precious for anybody anytime but for fighters where you ver you probably don't see your kids for long periods at a time it's absolutely massive so yeah they're all hoping he's going to fall off the wagon but he's not going to he's got it in his mind what he wants to do where he wants to go how he wants to finish that's what tyson will do and i think uh, i don't think anybody will step in his way i think i think he beats wilder the sec i think he beats wilder again and then i think you know you've got to hope that joshua and him fight each other do you think it's the Maybe the people behind Tyson and the people behind 
Joshua that don't want the fight to happen because I just think it's just dragging out too long, me, this. Well, of course it is. Of course. Because Pulev fight's not done. The Wilder fight, why don't they just bin the belt? No belts and let them both get at it. Yeah, which again they won't do because they want it to be all or nothing. They want it to be for the belts. And, and, and I think as well the pandemic's playing its part because they want it to be in front of a, a live audience. The last thing you want is Anthony Joshua fighting um, Tyson Fury in Eddie Hearn's garden. In Eddie Hearn's back garden. <laughs> <laughs> which yeah, well yeah or in the desert in Saudi yeah. which is where I think the fight will take place anyway um, but you don't want it you, you want a crowd there for God's sake you want people to have the opportunity to go and see it um, but that's not the reason this is getting dragged out it's it's been it, it's always going to get dragged out mm. we saw it with 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 what what should have been the greatest fight ever which was Pacquiao Mayweather and that was a damp squib that was a squib it was dragged out too long Steve wasn't it yeah and that's the, that's the problem you, that's the problem you've got it gets dragged out and gets dragged out and it's, a, it's an absolute waste of time you know mm. what do you think about Billy Joe Saunders uh, do you think his career is going to peter out or do you think after today's news regarding Canelo suing Dazone and suing Golden Boy do you think that Kit, Billy Joe Saunders could career could get back on track now that him and Callum Smith have to fight now, don't they? Yeah, I think Billy Joe Saunders' career will get back on track. I've got no doubt about yeah. that. I think he'll. Um, I think essentially, he's had a few ups and downs. He's had a few nightmares. You know, nightmare yeah. situations. Some, yeah. some, some have been his own. Some have been through his own stupidity, but others yeah. have been through other other people getting involved. Yeah. And I think, no, I think his career. I think his career is back on track. I think again he's focused. He's got himself. He's got himself focused on what he wants to do, and I think you know. I think he'll progress. You know, I've, I've got a lot of time for Billy. You know what I mean? He's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's like Tyson. He's a character, he's another yeah. he's another character, but he's another he's, he's he's got potential to be. He's a people's champion, but I, I think he'll be. I think he'll be a champion. The Canelo thing's interesting though today. Mm -hmm. You told me that, and I hadn't seen. I hadn't seen yeah. the news. Um, the problem is with legal battles. They don't. They don't happen quickly. The drag on and on and on. Do you know what I mean? So when you hear about a legal battle and something happening, um, you know there's no quick fix to that. That and no. you know this is the only, the only people who win out the legal battles are lawyers. Mm. What do you think about Luke Campbell, uh, Steve? Do you think that he'll win a world title? <sighs> it's a tough. You think he's getting on a bit now. It's a tough one that uh, Luke fought one of my fighters, Neil Hepper. Yeah. Uh, Hepper obviously retired now, but yeah. he took on he took on the fight at a couple of weeks' notice. He should never have took the fight. Um, mm. I wasn't managing him at the time. I just remember him. I remember him having back-to-back -back battles. Mm. Um, he, he looks sharp. Huh? He looks a lot better than he he has in the past. But again, it's it's you know how, how's he been coping through lockdown? We, yeah. we, we've spoken about this. You're 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 in Sheffield. I'm in I'm in you know in in Gateshead. Um, fighters are struggling to keep yeah. fit. Uh, and, and, and take over we know gyms have reopened recently but it's not the same do you know what I mean it's not the same as what you could have done you can go out and do your road work but just you know all these different rules and regulations are making it a little bit more difficult you know and people are putting pounds on that they shouldn't be and you know can you keep the shop up sparring sparring's difficult because you're finding sometimes you might have organised some sparring in one area and then suddenly that area's locked down uh, it, it, it's you know it's not boxing it's not the boxing world as we know it but could Luke Campbell win? Um, you know, a t uh, you know, a title I, 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 again. A bit like Dave Allen. Do you know? Yeah. He's, you know, any fighter, any 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 fighter has got a he's got a chance when he steps through the ropes. But it, it's just how well he's how well he's prepared. He deserves it. I think he's deserved. He's got to that. He's got to that level. He's a grafter, and again, he's he's one of the nicer people in boxing. You know. Yeah. Uh... Sky have had a lot of criticism online and they've come out and Adam Smith's come out and issued an apology regarding the bias and things like that. Do you think it were a bit biased, the Dylan White fight, the, the actual show? Uh, or do you think that they've got to big their own home fighters up? It's uncharted territory really. Um, you know, I've watched, I've watched the shows that have been available. I've watched Sky and I've watched BD Sport. Warren and and Hearn. Um, I've got to be honest, I've enjoyed them. I've enjoyed yeah. both shows. I didn't think I would enjoy the BT Sports shows, but I've en I have enjoyed them because it's in a studio. I quite like the idea of Eddie Hearn's back garden. I know you know a, a lot of people don't like the idea. I think it's it's quite. Well, you don't have to pay a, 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 a arena fee, does he? <laughs> I've got to honest. 
I always laugh. I, I laugh and take my hat off to Eddie because I think, well, you know, he's thinking outside the box, and it's, it's you know, he does not have to travel far. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it's it, it it just made sense. But I've enjoyed it. In, in it was just nice to see boxing back after a sab- an enforced sabbatical. Um, criticism, uh, you know, they have they have got to big their own fighters up. I think it comes back down to the simple fact that we know that it's all about money, and this is what comes back to t- TV. It's all about mm. money. And the contracts that they, that they have are very specific about what they have to provide as as form of entertainment, and you know it's the only way it's the only way they can do it. They have to big up and, and promote promote their own fighters. Some of these fights that that they put on, especially the ones that they put on pay per view, you know, you you end up shaking your head thinking that was never a pay per view show. Yeah. But it's because that the, the pen, and you said was it twenty shows they've got to put on. 20, 20 a year Sky put on, don't they? Yeah. yeah. I think he does 40 a year with us on. Yeah, and that's what you're looking at. You've, you, they've got to hit those. They've got to hit those targets. But they've they've got to they've got to promote and you know push their fighters to to get people to watch and you know if it's a pay per view to get them to subscribe to it. You know. Um, My argument with pay per view is I know I always revert back to this and I get stick for it, but I remember when uh, Mick Hennessy were trying to get Carl Froch. Uh, Pay per view on Sky, and they had uh, they went into the Super Six tournament, and they didn't want to know, and they said it has to be a certain criteria, blah blah blah. Well, Froch Boutte, when he were we Eddie Earn, that weren't pay per view, but Boutte were classed as the man at the time, and Froch were coming off at Super Six, so if that ain't pay per view, but forward eight year, we've got Eggington Cheeseman non-pay-per-view like Froch Booty were. So do you think the product is now watered down, Steve, over the last eight years? Yeah, I do, yeah. I do. I do think it is. And, and that's, you know, that can be an issue. You're always going to get people who buy everything and, and want to watch every pay-per-view. But it, it's, it's got to be, for me, it's got to be a certain standard. Um, yeah. I don't, I you know, the certain... You're not into this stat cards thing, you know, to fill it out. <sighs> I mean, I enjoy the it. headlines. Got to be a fight. Dennis said to me when I first yeah. started. Was, I agree. Pay per view loss. When it started, he said he remembers being in HBO offices in America. I think it was New York, and he said they were all sat down talking about it. And he said, Dennis, pay per view is supposed to be when you say, "Hey, we can't miss this fight." Yeah. It's pay per view. We need to get home. This pay per view's on. Whereas now it's just come like speed cameras. Piggy yeah. Banks. Yeah. That's what I find. Do you agree with that? I agree, and I agree with it. I mean, for me, pay per view should be something like, like Ben Eubank or, yeah. you know what I mean, Tyson Holyfield. That is mm. that is a pay per view event. It's, yeah. you know, you know, having some of these names which, you know, you struggle to think. Well, Dylan White against a 41 year old Povetkin <sighs> for no world title, not even a European title. That shouldn't be pay per view. That should be available. That should be available. Non-pay-per-view. I mean, you know, it's. It's like with the football, it's been a blessing to see Premier League on BBC One. Yeah. I mean, it's the first time for 30 years. Yeah. And, you know, this, you know, people pay a TV licence and they can't watch live Premiership football on, 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 a, on a terrestrial channel. There's no access because Sky dominates that particular field. Ridiculous. Yeah. But with the pandemic and because people are having to sit and watch games at home, um, you know, you've got a situation where the Premier League starts on Saturday and you're going to have... That that is wide open. That they're all going to be tele- all the games are more or less televised again for another month. Boxing, yeah, it's got to be a big name that's at the top of the bill to to justify that. And and as you say, stacking the cards up, it, it doesn't make any difference if it's if it's a load of you know inadequate fights, but they're stacked up and they're, they're charging twenty quid for that. It's 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 bang out of order. And you know, you you remember as well, people are paying the subscription for Sky or BT, you know, you can't, you don't just pay one fee and you get everything, you've got to pay for this, you've got to pay for this, this is an add-on, that's an add-on, you know, and when you start looking at your bills, and this again is why boxing as a sport will will have to adapt and change, um, if this continues, which again I'm saying we're, we're led to believe it's going to, then people won't have a job, yeah. it's people losing jobs, shops are shutting on a regular basis, restaurants will shut, bars will shut, because there's no work, there's no jobs. Nightclubs haven't reopened yet. If we get another shutdown, they're going to lose Christmas. Some of them will go bust. Um, we're going to end up in a situation where there's more people on the door and, and yeah. have no work. And when you're in that position, what happens is you start cutting your costs. Yeah, so, and scale a bit first to go from people. But yeah, because you've got you've got terrestrial TV, you've got a free box. You can you know yes, you're going to miss X, Y, and Z, but people just won't be able to afford it. Sky are already cutting back. Sky been cutting back for the last eighteen months, yeah. staff wise. We've seen you've seen it with 
you've seen it with the boxing you've seen yeah. you're now seeing it with football you've seen it like the the people who do um soccer saturday with jeff stellan all yeah. gone after 17 years of of having it nice and easy they got rid of charlie nicholas didn't they well he's gone phil thompson's gone matt latizzi is gone now this isn't a rebrand this is cutting back do you know what i mean this is this is getting this is cancelling all these big contracts and bringing in new people who are probably on less money um and, and probably on less hours it's it's the way of the world unfortunately and that's what's going to hit boxing because you you know you you can't charge people if they're not you know some of them won't be there as you see the wood they'll just cut their subscriptions sky bt they'll all suffer they'll all lose um we might see the return of you know these kind of things to terrestrial tv and wouldn't that be great if we're all sitting at home getting it for free i'd like to see bbc because they take tv license off people don't they yeah well, bbc i mean itv channel five you know we've seen boxing more on terrestrial tv than we've seen football over the last 30 years um yeah. you know albeit not the great fights the big fights but might have to return to that to keep the to keep the boxing industry alive do you think that savannah marshall and carissa shields happens in december i'd like to see savannah marshall happen before the end of the year i want to see lewis rich in box before the yeah, end of the year yeah. you know because we had a big show planned in october in the northeast but so far no no announcement from matching as to whether that's going ahead um you know it, it, it obviously got put back up put back to october but with a with a recent announcement by the government that you know you know about places you know having to remain closed or big groups of people not being allowed to go i mean it's a it's a, it's a stupid rule groups of six you know you can't have more than a group of six going out um but i mean how do you monitor that do you know what i mean 10 people you know 10 people can easily buy tickets for the arena um individually and then all go to the arena to watch the boxing that's a group of 10 do you know what i mean it's yeah. like it just doesn't uh, the, the rules aren't making much sense at the minute and that's going to affect things but yeah i mean i'd love to see that i'd love to see that happen and um you know savannah marshall's great you know great fighter she's Punches fem like a mule. female boxing is 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 you know it, it, it it's on the up you know i mean mm. i had the opportunity to sign april hunter but i didn't she's obviously come on and made a debut up in the northeast through phil being on our shows she won a phil's fighters she well, she went to phil she went to phil instead of me but i've i've took shannon bourne first first ever female boxer from darlington and um she's she's like a little pocket rocket um you know really really good fighter so i mean i'm looking at it and you know I, I, watching people like savannah they're, they're a big influence to these people you know so it'd be good to say i fight you know before the end of the year will she fight before the end of the year god knows you know because you know it, it you know these decisions are down to the promoters mm interesting uh well it's been it's been great to speak to you steve yeah i knew uh, you're a good interview uh you've got a wealth of knowledge about a lot of things haven't you yeah mate. yeah, yeah. Uh, good luck with some of the products uh, products uh, some of the uh, projects that you've got com coming up you know especially the freddie foreman film i'd be interested to go to that if you could get me in at the premiere i'll oh, do that for you yeah you yeah. Bring, just, premiere just, bring, just bring just bring just bring it just bring your camera and we'll just turn up yeah exactly all the best then steve to you and your family uh thanks very much for uh, having me up here and you've been fantastic cheers mate you take care mate thank you Bye. well i enjoyed that uh with steve rafe from newcastle uh, He's spinning a lot of plates, writer, actor, producer, events, he does live events, uh, evenings with kind of thing, boxing promoter, uh, managing fighters and that, and obviously he's, he's got Mrs. Two Kids and writing books, he's a, he's a busy bloke, a uh, very busy bloke, but uh, I enjoy it, it's restored my faith in proper people in boxing who are genuine, so look to Steve Rave. I hope that this virus goes and uh, then Steve can prosper with all his business interests but enjoyed that today so blasting down A1 here. What I like about the A1 there's no cameras. Well, I haven't seen one yet but uh, well, you can get your 80 mile an hour job can't you 90 on the way on and make some good time. You go to London I go to London to see Mark Tibbs and I get congestion, emission, Dartford Tunnel and parking tickets. It's a small fortune there but you come up here up north, straight in, do job, come home in and out, it's fantastic. So I should get rid of that M1 or M25, make it like A1 I reckon but. So good luck to Steve Rafe, 
we'll get this video jazzed up over the next two or three days and we'll get it out there so all right so thank you for liking and subscribing and leaving a comment and sharing the video all right big shout out to boxing asylum lads innovation alloys south yorkshire packaging uk limited and big shout out to dennis hobson hashtag team player <laughs> go on, peace out <laughs> you like that one, didn't you? Right, first of all, I just want to say thank you very much for liking and subscribing. It means a lot to me. Because uh, we're on this journey together, aren't we? So, anybody got any ideas for the channel, fire them over to me. PokyCorner at mail.com. Alright? Shout out to Innovation Alloys and South Yorkshire Packaging. Alright? Don't forget to subscribe, keep on trucking. <laughs>